Dr. Ed Bynum and I would like to present the results of the research we've been doing the last three years with uh, endomopathogenic nematodes to control corn rootworm. Uh, and this is done in conjunction with Dr. Elson Shields at Cornell University and Dr. Caitlin Kessheimer at Auburn University. Our corn rootworm problem occurs on the high plains where we don't rotate corn. Where we do annual crop rotation, corn rootworm is not an issue. Um, but where we can't, it does become an issue because they build up year over year. Our main species of concern is the western corn rootworm, which is pictured in the larger photo. We don't really have northern corn rootworm, and southern corn rootworm is its a minor pest, although down in the south part of Texas it can be a major pest. Rootworms damage corn by chewing the roots. That's what they do. And they're small larvae, they look kind of like a maggot. But when you get hundreds and hundreds feeding on a root system, they can do a lot of damage. Generally, first time it's noticed is when you get goosenecking with larger plants or when they are plants are drought stressed when they shouldn't be. And then you dig up the roots and notice that they've been pruned. Generally, you can suffer a little bit of root damage. It's not going to do any economic harm. But after you get, oh, one half to one node of roots pruned off, then you start losing significant amount of yield. And it, basically in the Midwest, where they've done the studies, uh, one node of roots pruned is about 15% of your grain yield. And we don't have any idea um, what the yield loss is in silage corn. And as you can see on the far right, all three nodes of, of uh, roots are pruned off on that corn. Well, nemat enemopathogenic nematodes, that, that means that they kill insects. They do not hurt plants. They do not hurt people or animals. They just kill insects. And they're naturally occurring and they're found uh, in most soils worldwide. And this is um, how we harvested some of these to put them to our use. There are two genera that we work with, uh, Steiner nematids and heterorhabditids. And we use them in combination because they each do something slightly different than working together, they do a very good job. The way it works is uh, Carpocaps, Steiner nematocarpocapsi, stays basically in the top two to three inches of the soil. And it's an ambush nematode. It just waits until the, the prey comes by. Whereas Steiner nematocarpocapsi is an ambush and a cruiser. It means it moves around a little bit and it tends to live in the top eight inches of the soil profile. Whereas Heterorhabditis bacteriophora moves uh, throughout the so soil profile. So <clears throat> working with Cornell, we came up with a good mix for our experiments. And by using these in combination, we've got Carpocapsi in the top two inches, Feltii in the top eight inches, and then Heterorhabditis bacteriophora throughout the profile. So we've got different method, different forms of nematodes uh, at work in the root zone. Nematodes infect the host by entering natural openings. The spiracles, the mouth, the anus. Uh, and when they're in there, they release bacterial bacteria, and the bacteria kill the insect larva. And then the infected juvenile, which is what gets in the insect, becomes an adult and reproduces. And there, there are several generations in that insect cadaver. The insect dies very quickly, but the nematodes keep reproducing inside the body up to a point where the body's full of these infective juveniles and they come out and they, they just come out of the body and they look like a little uh, gray haze around the cadaver. There are fundamentally two types of endopathogenic nematodes. The natives, which are out there in nature, and commercial ones, which have been reared in a laboratory setting, basically in vats. And to explain the difference in these, this is Dr. Elson Shields uh, in May of 2019 as we were applying these nematodes to a commercial farm near Dalhart. 
So here we have 25 million persistent nematodes which have been reared in wax moth larvae in a very low labor method and while they don't look like it you can actually see the nematodes on the side and the, the, what we're doing here is is capturing the wild traits that allow these nematodes to persist across uh, times with no host across winter and therefore is a single application will last in the field for multiple seasons. Now the same species of nematodes are available in commercial. You can buy them in many catalogs. The difference is they've been continually reared and they've lost the genetics to persist. They typically only persist in the soil between 7 and 30 days. These particular wild ones along with most wild ones will persist in the soil without feeding for one to two years. In fact, this particular strain will survive in the lab for two and a half years without eating anything at room temperature. So this persistence is how they actually get across no host in the field. The, the real issue with persistence is what we call phased infectivity. So what the wild nematodes do is there will be 100,000 new nematodes that come out of each one of these cadavers and only less than 40% of them can immediately find a host and infect. The rest of them are in a suspended animation and when their little clock, the clock goes off in their, their system, at some later point they become infected. So some of these in this cup will not be infected for a couple of years. Some of them are immediately infected. Okay, so the first thing we do is, is uh, we just dump all this out. This is like, like these are actual uh, wax worms and they're sold uh, in sawdust for the fish bait industry. And, and so this cup is actually sold for fish bait. We inject in nematodes and they breed in here. There's 25 million nematodes in here. So the, the small infective nematode goes internal into the insect. They release a bacteria that they take with them. The bacteria actually kills the insect, dissolves its innards. And then the nematode, which only has sucking mouth parts, just sucks off all the nutrients and reproduces. And so it's a, it's a special relationship. The, the nematode releases a chemical to suppress the immune system. So with corn rootworms, the nematode goes in and suppresses the immune system of the bacteria and the duplicate. Where rootworms might develop resistance, like to everything else, it would be a resistance to that chemical that suppresses their immune system. Okay. So, so what we do here, the nematodes, the 25 million nematodes are, are in the sawdust, uh, on the sides of the cup, on the bottoms of the lids, until we generate about 20 gallons. And so what we're doing is, is flushing the nematodes out of the sawdust. Now, are we getting all of them out of the sawdust? Probably not, you know. And so typically when we do this over in the corner of the field or by somebody's garden, we throw all the sawdust and then they probably get nematodes uh, for the garden. Our Texas study began in 2017, and the field had been in continuous corn for many, many years and had major corn rootworm problems. So the grower and consultant invited us to come up and, and do this trial. And we put out the application on uh, May 11th of 2017, and the soil was nice and wet, which it should be ideally when you're putting out nematodes to keep them alive. So we had ideal uh, application conditions. We used Steinernema carpocapsi uh, and Steinernema feltii from uh, Cornell, and also their special heterorhabditis uh, bacteriophora. So all three of these strains came from Cornell, and they are... Uh, persistent strains. They are not commercial strains. 
here's some data. These are 2017 data, and you know we put we put the nematodes out in May, and we didn't expect to see any results till the next year or possibly the second year. But we went back uh, in July and sampled corn roots, and this was non-BT corn. <clears throat> and we I'll show you the root ratings in a second. But the way you tell whether the nematodes are present and and doing their job one way is to take soil cores, just a standard soil probe. And then you take those, we sent, took those and sent them back to the lab at Cornell and they put wax moth larvae on them. And wax moth larvae are an excellent host. So larvae that are killed by nematodes, you know those nematodes are present uh, and still infective. And so they can they test for all three species of nematodes on these wax moth larvae. So these soil samples with or without endopathic genetic nematodes is an excellent way to tell whether they're still present and still working. The, this plot shows over time the number of the different species right after we inoculated, uh, right outside the plots, and then in the fall of 2017, spring of 2018, and fall of 2018. So let's look at... Uh, in this particular treatment was Steiner Nemo carpal capsi and Steiner Nemo feltii applied to these plots. We didn't recover uh, star carpal capsi in the soil cores uh, in 2017 through 2018. Probably still there at very no low numbers, but our sampling method can't pick it up. However, Steiner Nemo feltii did establish very well. Uh, initially, in the fall of 2017, 13% of the cores were positive. That went up to 28% in the spring of 2018 and 15% in the fall of 2018. Uh, there was, even though we didn't apply it to the plots, we did pick up heterorhabditis bacteriophora uh, starting in the fall of 2017. And that's because the harvest equipment, this is, this is a silage field, the harvest equipment is moving soil and plant matter between plots and it moved some of these bacteriophora. But that's okay. Uh, it's not a problem. So uh, on balance, we had, say, uh, anywhere from 50% down to 27% of the soil cores that had enomopathic nematodes, which is a high number. That means they are successfully established. Let's look at another treatment. This is Steiner Nema feltii and heterorhabditis bacteriophora put out in the plots. And you can see that feltii established very well, similar to the, the previous slide, and bacteriophora established very well. And the total number of cores positive for these nematodes uh, after the initial treatment was anywhere from 35 to 48 percent, which is again excellent. Here's our untreated controls, and you, you expect to see zeros all the way across, but right in the fall of 2018, we started picking up uh, heterorhabditis bacteriophora. And that's again because the, side, the harvest equipment moved those nematodes into the control plots, which were actually a whole pivot tower away from the treated plots. So it's a highly mobile, able to move uh, nematode. And in fact, these nematodes move, oh, one about a meter a year maybe a little bit more by themselves in the soil but when you start running tillage equipment or harvest equipment through a field they move a lot more quickly here's some uh, root pictures this is from july of 2017 only three months after we put the nematodes out we were shocked to see these numbers because again we didn't expect any differences so the carpocapsi and feltii treatment had an average rating, root rating on the, the Iowa scale of 1.43, whereas the uh, untreated had 2.39. That means 2.39 nodes of roots had been chewed off. Here's a photo of the roots of the plots from Steiner Nema feltii and heterorhabditis bacteriophora. Uh, and they had an average root rating of 1.81. And this is the same slide as the previous slide on the bottom. That's the untreated check that had a 2.39. And work done uh, since 2017, especially in, in Cornell, has shown that 
These nematodes provide about one node of root protection to corn. Now, Progressive Farmer ran uh, a cover piece on this in, in work in February of 2020, and they detailed the, the work at Dalhart and the fact that these nematodes now are starting to be investigated more widely uh, in many parts of the country. We took this technology, we spent two years figuring it out in Texas, and then uh, we and Cornell moved it to New Mexico because some of the private consultants wanted to try it. And so we're, we're going to show um, a little bit of data from New Mexico. Prior to this New Mexico work, it was thought the very best way to put these nematodes out is, is with a tractor um, dribbling water out of the, the boom onto the field, and the water contains the nematodes. And you're not spraying it, you're dribbling it. But uh, Dr. Shields decided to go for broke and wanted to test center pivot systems. Uh, he was afraid the sunlight would kill the nematodes, but he said, let's go for it. And we did. This is a dairy operation, as most non-rotated corn is around here. And it had been in corn for a long time and it had major rootworm problems. Here's just some pictures of, of the application itself. The nematodes are put into this spray tank uh, on the left and pumped into the pivot. And then they come out as the water flows out down the length of the pivot. This field, <clears throat> they applied to a whole field. Um, we went back, this, the application was in May, and we went back in November and took 600 soil cores out of the field on transects to see whether the nematodes lived and how well they were doing. And <clears throat> we were quite surprised. The, uh, the picture on the left shows the total or the percentage of soil cores positive for nematodes on each of those six transects. Every, anywhere from 56% in the lower left-hand corner to 42% in the lower right-hand side. And so this is excellent establishment. We were shocked that it did this well. And then we wanted to look at whether the distribution of the nematodes was roughly equivalent from the center of the pivot to the outer tower of the pivot. And the, slot, the graphic on the right <clears throat> shows the outer tower, 45% of those soil cores were positive. Again, that's excellent. And as you move in the field, um, at the very center, it was 55%. But remember, these things are mobile, and they move on equipment too. So this is essentially a perfect establishment throughout the field by using a center pivot. So what are the potential applications um, of these nematodes for control of corn rootworm? And most of us know that our BT transgenic rootworm corn is now failing because rootworms have become resistant to it. In fact, every mode of action out there right now has resistance, and so it, it's in trouble. Now for non-BT corn in, in the upper Midwest, let's say New York, Michigan, the fringe states, it is possible these nematodes could be the only protection for corn. Um, and that's non-BT corn because their pressure is not that high. And, and so um, that might work and Cornell's looking at it. The other thing is nematodes are a completely independent mortality factor for corn rootworm. And they don't care if the rootworm's resistant to BT corn or not, they just kill rootworms. And so what they do when they're in the field is they kill off survivors. They kill off non-resistant insects, of which there are fewer and fewer, and they kill off the resistant insects, and it lowers the overall population of rootworms. Can it be used as a mitigation tool where our BT corn is failing? Perhaps. Uh, Cornell has done the most extensive studies and they've documented a big reduction in root damage. As I mentioned, possibly a node or so, maybe more. And they've also documented there's about a 50% reduction in the number of beetles coming off of nematode treated corn than just or non-BT corn. So they can, they can knock down the number of adults coming out to lay eggs for the next year's infestation 
And there's a lot of interest in pursuing uh, these nematodes for use in fields that have failed, where the BTs have failed. 